I'm Lynn Spencer. Um, I am the principal for historic preservation at my firm, which is Spencer, Sullivan, and Vote. We have offices in Charlestown, but we work all over the state, and we are very pleased to be here tonight. Our firm specializes on, in historic preservation work, as well as, well as well as the rehabilitation and renovation of historic buildings. Buildings like your Southbury, uh, Southboro Public Library are the kind of buildings that we excel in and, in and are very intensely interested in. Preserving a building like this is preserving a building that has enduring quality. It was built with materials that were, it was well made, well built, carefully designed. It was built in 1912 and has served over 100 years and with careful preservation and strategic investment, it can serve another 100 years. I have a slide presentation tonight. I am happy to be interrupted with questions, however, so don't hesitate. Now let's see if I can go in the right direction. Uh, am I going in the right direction? Yes. Yes. So here's your building. As I said, 1912, major addition in 1989. And during the period of that hundred odd years, you know, portions of the building have been rehabilitated and, and renovated and updated. But the exterior has pretty much preserved um, its original materials with some sort of ex some additions along the way, notably um, on roofing materials, but li very little else. Your load-bearing masonry walls are intact. Uh, the limestone is intact, the windows are intact. However, there are some deficiencies. Your front steps, for instance, are settling and, and moving, and that creates potential trip hazards. We have areas where there's the rust staining because of iron oxide, because of the grates here, and that well, it's not a necessarily a deficiency, is a visual um, deficiency, I, visual blemish, if you will, and kind of suggests a lack of care and maintenance, which I know is not really true, but it gives an appearance. You also see the staining, the sort of gray, grayish black staining that is a result of water going through the open joints and then draining down and collecting with basically um, algae deposits on the bill on the uh, the uh, stone at the cornice level we have uh, an Indiana limestone that <coughs> is in relatively good shape um, what I will note are open mortar joints here and here what looks like cracking is actually um, old ivy that is still left the sort of traces of its branches on the building. You will also note here a series of anchors. We're not quite sure what their purpose was, um, but they are iron anchors that are into the masonry and corrode and can open up um, the, the mortar joints. One thing that is a curiosity, quite honestly, is this section of the, uh, the carved stonework, where this particular section of stone, this limestone, has eroded quite noticeably. Now, some of that has to do with drainage off this, this section of the extended cornice. And you'll see there a layer of, of lead uh, coated copper that goes over the edge, but this may be inherent, what's called by conservators, inherent vice in the stone. You know, stone is a natural, this is a sedimentary stone, and it's, it's bedding layers, you know, maybe more, there may be more clay in it, there may be other things that have caused a little bit more erosion than we see elsewhere on the building. This is the, one of the areas of the receiving area. Um, it demonstrates, again, a series of open mortar joints and the kind of staining, as well as some open joints above. And when I say joints, what I'm referring to is the layer of mortar between the masonry units. 
That's a close-up view of one of those embedded anchors, and you can see that it actually has resulted in some of the mortar being opened up. Now, what that, and popping off, what that means is that that's a place for water to, to go into the building and eventually get into the inner white walls of this load-bearing masonry. Ah, part of what is gives this building great character are these large windows. Of course, at the time this building was built in 1912, electricity was part of the story, but there was a great deal of interest in natural light in reading rooms. These windows are in, in, in quite, they're in very good repairable shape. These are wood windows, and a wood window, well weather stripped um, and tight, is a, one of the best energy windows that you can have when it is further protected with a storm panel, which is what you have here. What gives a window actually um, energy conserving value is the airspace between the two panes of the two sections of glasswork. And uh, we hardly recommend and have, have recommended the repair and conservation of the windows, weather stripping, and a new storm pan. This is one of the basement windows, and you can see the peeling paint. Um, so far, no damaged woodwork. But without the action of scraping and painting, and paint is not just for aesthetic values, but it is actually, you know, helps protect the wood below. Without the kind of intervention now in, in taking care of this, these windows, there will potentially be wood deterioration. So now is the time to act. Uh, this photograph simply shows one of the panels above the, the uh, entry door. These doors were replaced. We're not sure exactly when. Um, that's an aluminum storefront assembly. Not the original, but certainly does the job as an opening to the building. They were replaced about two years ago. Two years ago. OK, thank you, Ron. Is that the original board? I would have to check with the facilities department. More examples of now. This is a this is is a cellar window which shows some of the deterioration of of um, damage to the woodwork itself. This can be repaired with epoxy uh, and infill and uh, a good paint job. Now we're getting up to the roof parapet. This is the actually the line of stonework around the very top edge of the 1912 uh, roof. And you're seeing some of the, that's some caulking that has been applied to the stonework to try to hold those joints. But otherwise, we have periodically open mortar joints. OK, now we're getting, and that, what I was referring to was this level. Uh, this is the 1912 edition with its extended wings. Oh, yeah. And this is a close-up of the uh, lead-coated copper that covers portions of the parapet. And you can see that these joints, which are lead solder joints, are starting to crack and open up. I will also point out a rivet here, which actually connects that lead-coated, that copper, to the stonework below. Copper is very... Um, has a lot of movement, it absorbs a lot of heat, and when you're designing copper work like this, you have to design in expansion joints and, and allow the copper to move, not to try to bind it up. And that binding, which is accomplished here with this rivet, will actually accelerate deterioration of that copper work. Lynn? Yeah, not everybody knows what a parapet is. Oh, yes, okay. Well, I would like to go back. Back to that parapet. Where this is this area right here that I'm talking about. And that very good coaching came from Mary Bolso, who is serving as the uh, owner's representative for the public library. 
We also observed some cracking of the brickwork, which is below that parapet. Let me just locate us. So this is brickwork in this area. And what you're seeing is cracking that goes all the way through. Now, part of that is related to the way the stonework is anchored to the brickwork below. We don't think that that is a structural issue. We think that is, that is an expansion or movement issue, but those joints should be um, sealed with new mortar. Now you're looking at an area of the 1912 roof where we've had the stone pulled back and we're looking at the membrane roof that was installed on top of the original built up coal tar and, and coal tar and gravel roof, which still exists below. You see the kind of sagging of this, this membrane and you can also see that it goes, it tucks up under the, what is called through wall flashing, which is immediately below that stone coping. And that's the original flashing. You're also seeing areas here where that membrane, instead of tucking up, this happens to be on the L that, that extends from the main block of the roof where that membrane sort of was pulled up and then riveted into the stonework with a line of metal and then fasteners through the stonework. That has then caused the stone to crack and spall. That's what those sort of divots are. And those areas have simply been caulked in. So this is quite honestly, a poor roofing detail that has caused other problems with the stonework. We were fortunate to have um, Titan Roofing assist us in the investigation work. Titan is a well-known roofing company based in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Mary arranged for this. Um, and so what you're looking at here are test openings because we wanted to look at what was the situation with the parapet and what was the situation with the roof deck below. So with the parapet, that's that vertical element that is, that is around the perimeter of the 1912 edition. The brick, and you, you remember that the membrane was pulled up and then tucked under the flashing. What you're looking at here is brick that is starting to deteriorate. Those are flecks of brick that have fallen off along with mastic which was applied to hold or call it glue that was applied to hold this membrane more or less in place. At this level you're looking at a test cut into the roof below where the insulation that was applied on top of the old coal tar and, and uh, uh, gravel roof was installed, but there was enough, what, what happened is that there was no sort of tight enclosure of this insulation against, against the brick wall. So heat came up from the building below, was trapped in this space by the, by the membrane, and basically cooked the brickwork. There was a lot of moisture that was held in place. There was no place for it to escape. And as a result, the brickwork started to crumble. I just want to go back to this for a second. The other thing that we did was have uh, a hazardous materials analysis done, done. And not surprisingly, because we've seen this before, we found asbestos in some of the materials that were part of the original roof. So in this roofing project, there will be asbestos abatement as well as a replacement roof. This is the, one of the drains 
um, that allows the moisture to sort of you know, exit the roof. Um, you can see the, the sort of buildup of moss and algae around it. This is an indication that you know, it's not draining well, it's not collecting everything well, and that is also causing deterioration of the roof and potentially the roof deck below. Uh, the idea of I installing stones on top of membrane roofs was popular a few years ago. Uh, we now do glue down membrane roofs. So, you know, what basically these stones were doing was holding the roof down in place. This is a, a view, I, again, of th this is of the chimney, which has a protected cap as well as an opening. Uh, and this would also be treated as part of the roofing project. So what are we recommending? You know, I was showing you photographs that were showing our analysis of the conditions. We recorded this information. Um, on drawings as well as a, f a photographic and, and narrative description of what we saw. Our recommendations are to um, strip this. So here's our 1912 historic library with its original rear wings, which were part of the reading stack areas. We are recommending that the this roof be completely stripped including the under roof, the original roof below, and that the parapets be completely repointed and um, new through wall flashing be installed, as well as new flashing at the extended cornice level. So what does that mean? When I say the parapets, again, it's this upper section of brickwork capped by the limestone. And then at the cornice level, we've got this extended limestone cornice with that sort of that eroded south section of the Southborough sign here. So you're seeing our notes all over these drawings, which is a combination of intensive work at the roof level and at the cornice, uh, which really is designed to arrest the deterioration of the brickwork, uh, make sure that the roof is weather tight, and um, extend the life of this building. We are also recommending, oops, we're also recommending that those embedded metal anchors that I was pointing out, those are shown in red, be removed and those areas uh, repointed. The front steps, is a, an extens is an extensive project. Um, the way those original steps were, were made were usually put on stone foundations, not on a concrete footing. So we're recommending that those steps be disassembled, the stones saved and, and for reinstallation, that a new concrete foundation is installed so the stones will not settle or move anymore, and then the stones get reinstalled. Uh, excuse me, on the, the shaded, the, the elements shaded in purple are your historic windows, which we are recommending that they get uh, scraped and painted in areas where there's wood repair needed, that, that wood repair take place, and then a prime coat and two full coats of paint be installed. This is the side elevation. You're simply seeing more of the same kind of description of proposed work. The areas where we are showing the cracking, we are saying that those bricks should be, that those, uh, those areas of cracking should be um, carefully repaired. And in some cases, it may be necessary to actually replace the brick themselves. And that's, that's not a, you know, that sounds kind of difficult, but it's actually, you know, pulling out the brick and replacing it with a, a, a replica brick. This gives you the extended view of your library building. 
Our work is focused on the historic library building, but we certainly acknowledge that you have a 1989 wing. So, how does it get, to, how do we sort of wrap this up into the next phase? Well, this is a detailed cost estimate, which is broken down by the section of work itself, by the quantities of the items um, in, in involved along with unit prices. The costing was based on two, well, three primary elements. One is we did consult with the roofing company that we retained to look at, they do the test cuts as well as the repair of the test cut openings. And they gave us roofing cost information as well as flashing um, information. We then turned to our experience working with historic buildings and looked at the kind of pricing that we were seeing in recent projects to help guide the the pricing that we associated with the masonry restoration, the window restoration, and the painting work. Overall, and I realize that this slide is difficult to read, so I do have copies of this presentation that I can give to you. Um, but overall, we're looking at a project that is just shy of $980,000. So what does that mean? That means that you all of the elements on your the exterior of your historic building would be uh, carefully repaired and and treated for uh, extended life of the building it includes the general conditions the general requirements of a contractor working on a building like this it assumes that this is a public bid project and would be going out to a competitive bidding process So with that, I will stop talking and welcome your questions. So with the, um, on, on the roof part where you're recommend, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Um, with the roof part where you're recommending to totally remove the whole layer on the front part of the building, and you said that there's asbestos underneath that, which mm -hmm. then, of course, is, um, adds an additional cost. Um, is it, is, the roof is not leaking currently, correct? I just, do I, I can't, sorry. Well, it either leaks or it doesn't. Somebody ought to know that. I, I do. So, yeah, there. Yes, right. you want to talk mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, we can. So actually, if you, on your way out, you can see, this was what I referenced at the advisory and selectman meeting last night. Can I, you can actually eyeline see right there. That is, these, that was the exterior of the um, 1912 building. And then everything that we're in right now is the 89 edition. You can actually see where water has come in through the roof. We normally have to do patchwork every right. time. Yeah. Now that, d that doesn't happen every time it rains, right. but when we have heavy, heavy rainfall, um, the roof just can't handle the stress. Yes, yeah. it's the design of a flat roof, obviously. It, it is. I, I think my hesitation was, when I, when I just hesitated, was to say that you've got leaking at this really critical addition of the 1912 to the 1989 building. Right. What we what we saw was saturated insulation in the 1912 building. Absolutely saturated materials. Mm -hmm. So that can be a combination of that rising heat and condensation, but it also can be potentially water coming in at joints around those roof drains and then circulating out. Sometimes it will get absorbed in that insulation and be held for a long time right and yeah. not necessarily leak below but it's it's oh, that no. roof cut was very revealing in terms of how saturated that yeah. insulation really yeah. was right. assuming they were able to get that thoroughly dried off because you don't want to cover over anything that's wet is, were any other options explored other than taking everything off in other words with the kind of um, material that they have these days 
where you can for flat commercial flat roofing um, it, where they can actually put it right over the existing was that explored at all yes and and in fact that condition that I was just describing of that saturated mm -hmm. insulation yeah really said that is not a really good option at all mm -hmm. that, that is really um, a heavy wet material that really should be re removed and replaced um, because the insulation is actually lost to the value of the insulation itself. Right. There's a couple things. <coughs> Leaving the wet insulation up there is going to continue to deteriorate the parapet, putting it in a, in a risk condition. Um, those bricks on the back were pretty thin. When we lifted up the membrane, it was amazing to see the fire skin of the brick was gone. It was sticking to the, to the glue. Uh, the other issue that I think could be part of the factor, uh, there are very few roof drains. So when you get a heavy rain, and the, the rain is spreading out farther than the roof drain, that might be where it's getting through. Um, it, well, you had mentioned about, it, is that the same area where the drains are that you pictured? Mm -hmm. um, that was one example of the drain. Because you mentioned something about the way the drains were working, or, or working or not working, so to speak. Um, and I, I guess the question is, is um, if there was some kind of um, surgery, for lack of a better word, that could be done um, to make the drains drain better, so to speak. So, so the way that this works, am I on now? I, I guess the, the thrust of my question is, is, this looks like the options that were looked at are pretty much like all or nothing. And it's a complete thing and nothing not that not that you want to do a repair job or a patchwork job or something but um, it, only because um, there I like to see options and I think a lot of people like to see what other options are looked at in terms of let's say for example there was a limit on money Mm -hmm. What would the what would be the object uh, the um, options that would come up? Well, I have to say, well, she's I, I, I have to say that is a very disturbing thing to me. So, a, a membrane roof is not an expensive thing in and of, in and of itself. It's a pretty economical roofing system in contrast to copper or mm -hmm. kemper or something like that. What this is telling us is that detail of how the, the membrane was wrapped up and sort of tucked under the roof at the main roof and then in areas here where it was actually fastened with fasteners into the stonework is a poor detail. And it is causing deterioration of your masonry, which ultimately could be uh, expose you to certain structural problems. So I don't see a way of patching this roof right now um, and, and you know, give you any reliable lifespan at all. I think you would create more problems by putting off what is, is quite honestly in front of you. This roof also technically has reached its lifespan. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, right. so, so if I if I were to su to suggest anything, it would be, you know, replace your roof. And we have priced this with one of the most economical roofing systems you can buy. What you've got that is pushing up the cost is the masonry work that has been caused by poor roofing details. Which brings me then to the next question is, um, where do you have those metal bolts go going into the brick? Mm -hmm. um, isn't there a way, and, and granted, if the metal is exposed to the elements, they're going to rust and that's going to cause a problem. Right. Um, isn't there a way, uh, for lack of a better term, to kind of plug up those holes? Without taking the metal out? Without taking the metal out. Nope, not really. It'd be, it, let me, I'm trying to get a picture of 
Yeah, no, I right. There, right. there you go. Yeah. Yep. yep. You know, if you plug it over with some caulking, that's going to pull. That's well, going to pop I, I think you'd want to use something a little bit more sturdy than caulking. And that's all I'm talking about is drilling that out and patching that area with mortar. If you leave the metal there, it will still be exposed to elements, and as it rusts, it expands, and it will damage other elements. One of the chief aims of Mary and Lynn's work, too, was in trying to historically restore the building, too. So, I mean, you guys had to look at it from a, also a repair perspective, obviously, with all of the problems, but I mean, that was, it, it wasn't just with the aim of, of repair work. Mm -hmm. It was really with, under the lens of also restoring the building to sort of its original grandeur. And, and I have to say, am I, if I'm on, um, I have to say that these materials, like this copper work here, have reached its life cycle. Right. We're seeing, you know, the yeah. cracking and so on. And we're seeing that, that the way it was originally installed was not the best method because of the thermal expansion of the copper. So, and I don't know, you tell me if this is the right uh, venue to ask this question. So suppose this money doesn't get approved. Um, I guess the, so then the question is, is what kind of a um, plan B is there knowing that there are repairs that need to be done sooner rather than later and that a new roof is needed and so that so I guess the, the thing is is that there's a way to fix stuff and it fixes it and there's a way to historically fix it I mean you just said you know you wanted to do it because it's a historic building and to fix it that way so to speak um, so I, I guess the question is is that is there a, uh, a plan B or a another plan worked into this a reduced plan I was I'm just I'm just facing it from I'm on the financial advisory committee sure. so the thing is is that I'm looking at it from the standpoint of you guys need the money if this does not get passed at town meeting what's plan B we would I would probably have to go to advisory and we would I would be with um, the facilities director John parent right we there is um, money currently in the capital plan that covers the 89 addition uh, for the roof for the roof I guess. not for the 1912 historic section because we were hopeful um, that this project would pass a town okay. meeting now if it doesn't pass we would I mean, I try to initially work with other members of the CPC to see if the roof could be separated out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't really, we, we talked with them about that in several meetings, and the feeling was is that there's work that needs to be done throughout the historic section of the building, and I didn't think they liked the idea of us going for multiple building projects. They really wanted it to be all-inclusive and for us to ask for everything all at once. The, when we did the assessment report, really what Lynn and Mary found was that the roof was in much worse shape than we had anticipated. And I think we were expecting it to be fairly bad. Yeah, we, we did our homework on this mm -hmm. um, by bringing in a, a, a licensed hazardous professional to do the, to test the materials and having a roof um, company actually open up. We had a better understanding of what really was right. needed. At the beginning when we started, John Parent had mentioned that he's gonna be putting a new roof on the building in the future, um, and we should coordinate any masonry work. Um, but then when we saw this, and John was up on the roof with us, he was he was shocked at what we found also. So, so I, I haven't addressed your question, is there a, a, a short-term and interim approach to this and it's it's a little bit troubling to me to return to this but I have to turn to this image again to say this is was so poorly detailed at the time this roof was put on it'd be hard to actually do something that is you know not going to be a similar thing but I suppose what you could do is replicate in membrane what was done before and 
you know, give yourself a few more years, not many, to actually address the masonry and the flashing issues related to it. It's not something that, that I would recommend. I, I have a question. Yeah. Would that would that potentially further damage the building, though? I think I think there is that potential. I mean, you still have to strip off this water-laden insulation. Right. And you really should strip off what is now the saturated wood or, or original roof below, because that's adding weight onto the deck here. So you're getting down to a substrate, and then you really have to work out a, a flashing detail that's going to pull this up, and at least for the short term, possibly cover that masonry but know that you are going to be doing masonry restoration and replacing that same thing in a few years time are there drains in the old part of the roof yes oh. yes 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 and the drains are a big part of the story you've already had drainage issues and water table issues that have affected the lowest portion of this building i know that you've got an engineering firm that has worked on a big drainage solution out here. Those roof drains need to be kept clean, need to be cleaned out and then properly routed to the new collection system. You know, this, I will say parenthetically, sure, we looked at the 1989 roof and we were surprised by the fact that there's only one roof drain in this entire roof. We think when this roof is being designs that additional drainage should be worked into the design. That could be in the form of a scupper, for instance, that takes excess water off the roof. But the problem with roof drains is if they start getting clogged and they're internal drains mm -hmm. like this, right. they can give you serious problems. Understood. We've also, we've met with John Parent and we've discussed the roof drainage issue so he's aware of that and you know Lynn was able to make some recommendations for future work I have to say that well you know restoration and preservation and you know getting back to things to tip-top form is something that we love to do we also love to keep water out of the buildings so, and we're always mindful that there are limitations on budgets. We, we understand that. But to be responsible about our recommendations and about the care that this building deserves, you know, we, we designed, a, it, we, our assessment, you know, made recommendations that we thought were prudent investments. Not extravagant investments, but prudent investments. Does anyone else have any questions? Thank you, Claire. Uh, with that, I appreciate, I want to say I want to thank you, Ryan thank John and to thank Mary for the opportunity to take a look at your wonderful historic building and if we can participate in its future preservation. Thank you Lynn. Thank you Mary. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>